There are only eight unit types in all of Total War Warhammer. Well, there's actually hundreds and it's probably a bit daunting for newer players or maybe you're even still playing your battles and not quite 100% sure what infantry is doing what. I've been mulling on this for quite some time for a few months actually, thinking what's the best way I can simplify this into a system where you could just instantly eyeball a unit card. No, that's what it's for. If I'm up against it, that's how I deal with it. And today we're going to go over those eight unit types as well as create a formation, which encompasses all of those unit types. If you're newer to the game, I definitely wouldn't use all of them at once. Now for the first unit type, defensive infantry. If there is one distinction that you learn from this entire video, please let it be this one. Now infantry can it may be monstrous infantry, depending what they're carrying, doesn't matter what it is, but they can be divided into offensive or defensive infantry. Defensive infantry have two roles. One is to either hold the line, the other one can be in the back lines to defend some very fragile artillery, archers, something like that. But let's talk stats for a second. You ideally want some armor, above 30 is nice, but this will vary quite wildly from race to race in the factions as well because of the different researchers, lord buffs, many different factors. But you want some armor, decent leadership, but the one you need to cheat most, this is the one, is melee defense. Melee defense is absolutely paramount. This is the chance that you will be hit. So the way the calculation works, it's about a 1 in 3 chance base. Increase it by your melee attack then subtract away the target's melee defense. By having higher melee defense, that will be wound back even more and these guys will stick around. The other key element is shields. Shields are incredibly powerful in Total War Warhammer. This is a bronze shield, which grants 35% blocking to all missiles, including gunpowder. Anything that's not artillery, this will block 35% of. A silver shield is 55%. So you can find this quite widely on your low level infantry. The idea is, is that they walk up and they screen the enemy. Now where do we place Amala infantry? Well, you can have them on the front line. Up here we've got one front and center, but also I like to draw a box around my formation. And we'll see why in just a moment. So we have a shielded spearman here and a shielded spearman here, as well as one on the front line. Often on the battlefield, you'll be at a range disadvantage. But on the front line, the most important thing is having these spearmen with shields. If the enemy does get close, they will shoot into these guys, meaning that they are wasting their ammo at the rate of at least 35% because of their shields. And keep in mind, the armor will also absorb some of that impact. We have our two on the flanks here, which we can stretch out and react to, which we might do here. So just holding the right mouse button down to stretch out a proper arc, and this will protect potential flanking here. And once we've dealt with this threat, we can then bring them up to the front line. We have another cavalry threat here, stretching that unit out and just moving. Also, your heroes and lords that are on foot, make sure you keep them moving, but they are an excellent melee infantry, well, particularly a defensive infantry as well. They can hold down an entire unit, getting excellent gunfire saturation. At this point here, as the enemy moves up, you can start pairing up your heroes and characters much more effectively. So the idea is to do this, pin the enemy in place with these defensive units with their high melee defense, respectable armor, and that will keep them in place for you to decide the outcome and the types of engagements you want. We can now move our offensive infantry, our greatswords. These are not a line holder, they're a damage dealer. We're moving them up here, and we're going to move them up here. They've been hit by artillery, another great way that we can hold the enemy in place and choose our engagements. Okay, now how do we instantly identify what type of infantry a unit is? Because it doesn't matter if it's monstrous, big, small, whatever, it will be the stat lines, but also the equipment they carry that helps define them. For nearly all races, the most quintessential line holder in the early game will be a spearman. If you can get one with a shield, then that is the absolute lottery. As we just mentioned, you can screen shields on the front line, meaning that they are safe to put up there, and any arrows that they're screening is taking value away from the enemy and protecting your units like your missile units that can give a return fire. Now, what is so good about spearmen? Well, they usually have higher melee defense than melee attack, which means that satisfies our definition of a defensive infantryman. They've got decent armor in this case. You can also increase this with research, but looking at the weapon strength, hover your cursor over, it will show the breakdown of it. It's a low level unit, so not too great armor piercing, but it has bonus versus large 15. 
This means a plus 15 to melee attack whenever they attack cavalry. It also means plus 15 damage. So that means when they're swinging to hit cavalry, it's not just 20, it will be 35. Now large doesn't just mean horses as well. In the early game, it's most likely going to be horses, but come the mid to late game, anything bigger than a horse is large and you will receive these benefits when attacking them. Your damage will also be increased, and this isn't just basic damage. Whatever percentage of armor piercing damage you do will be factored into this increase. Now, if you're wondering why we fanned our units out to face the enemy before, we did it in a long line to give us the biggest breadth that we could to stop them from attacking or getting through our lines, but we faced them and stood them still because when you stand still, it counts as bracing. Any enemy that attacks you head on is denied its charge bonus. That is absolutely huge because most good cavalry are shot cavalry and they rely on that charge so you shut them down here and you're now dealing that extra melee attack and damage so by having these units on the front line it instantly tells cavalry not bad idea and they'll go around the flanks and you can work around this predictable behavior. Just make sure you're facing the enemy because the brace won't work side on or from the rear so in your, with your own cavalry if you're going to attack make sure you do it from the side or the rear to deny that charge resistance. So spearmen, they are your anti-cavalry unit and your front line holders, even better if you have a shield. This is your early game defensive infantryman. But what about later in the campaign? Well, when you come tier three, tier four, you'll most likely have access to halberdiers. Well, you'll typically be fighting stronger enemies, quite likely monsters, and halberdiers are your monster slayers. Now, they can also double as a basic line holder because they're higher tier. They'll typically have good stats, but as you can see here, they will always have will nearly always have higher melee defense than melee attack. They are a defensive infantryman there to also absorb charges because they also have the charge defense versus large. And that's part of what these guys are doing here. If say a big griffin, something like that flies around here, these guys will be able to handle it. And yes, they do also have anti-large. Halberds will also have some good armor piercing. So this will hang much better in the later game. Now you might be asking, when would I maybe use all halberdiers or all spearmen? Well, it's often the opponent. If you're versing an archer heavy enemy, then maybe going shields the is going to be more preferable. If they're maybe like the dark elves, they've got some big beasties they might flank with. This is actually a really good setup. We can block the arrows from the front and deal with the beasts from the back. But if we're going to verse someone like the greenskins that don't really have any concern with range at all, then we would maybe consider swapping them out for all halberdiers. Now let's move on to our second unit type and that is offensive infantry. This is going to be characterized with much lower regard to defense. Let's just use this example. They've wrapped around this front unit here. What we could do is we move them up, we hook around and we smash them in the side or smash them in the rear. Now, they will take a 30% penalty to their melee defense if we hit them in the side. That goes up to 60% if we get them in the back. So it doesn't matter how good their melee defense is, when you're dealing with that kind of advantage and a charge bonus, which will also inflate your stats more, this can be incredibly decisive. Now, unlike cavalry, your infantry are probably going to sit there and just keep grinding them down. If you know you've got the superior infantry, you could run head on and grind away at them, but you don't want these guys taking the charge. You want these guys taking the charge, these guys picking the engagement with the flank, right? So it's a two step thing. Line them up and then bowl them over with these guys. Typically from the side if you can, once they've won one engagement, then stretch them out, get a good charge, and then get them to come and assist another front. The most important stat is of course melee attack, but you generally want some form of damage. Having a good charge bonus will also assist you here and any other bonuses can be nice. Units with good foot speed will definitely perform better here. Now dual weapons, it doesn't matter if it's two swords, two axes, two clubs, they typically have the same idea behind them. And if we compare them to a regular chosen, we can see a decrease in melee defense, but we see a boost in charge and a boost in weapon strength, and quite a substantial one as well. Looking at their stats, they also have bonus versus infantry. So when they can get that rear charge in, boy, is it going to hurt. Possibly more than any other unit, you can really see 
that dual weapons purely are an offensive unit and definitely not one to take defensively. You definitely don't need many of these. Remember, to get the maximum value, you need an existing engagement for them to flank into, preferably into the sides or preferably into the rear, and you will absolutely eviscerate them. But for this reason, it makes sense. You need someone to hold the line, someone to charge into it. You will always need more defensive infantry than offensive infantry unless you're being crafty through other means. But they don't have shields and they don't have anti-large. They're going to be good at dealing with lots of infantry, but this is incredibly matchup dependent and dealing with infantry, most factions have really great ways of doing this in the mid to late game which generally exceed what another infantry unit could do. In the mid to late game, you'll have the option of arming your infantry with great weapon variants, and these just really inflate the armor piercing damage. This also inflates the cost a lot, so you should use them sparingly, and they often have reduced foot speed, so getting those meaty charges can be a lot more difficult than with your more nimble tier two and tier three units. The only time you'd hire them en masse is if you see lots of armies coming at you, like dwarfs or chaos, which are very rich in armor, and just remember, Every race has at least some need for some line holding, but the damage they deal will typically come more from one of these particular unit types I'm getting into now. Next up, we have shock units. Now, shock units being shock cavalry. Now, the point of this is very, very similar to offensive infantry, but they're on a horse, so they sport all of that extra speed and can easily get those rear charges. The difference between shock cavalry is, it'll be Ready quite similar. You'll have your units engage, your defense, of infantry right that can hold the line with that nice high melee defense you then get your horses to the rescue they come in and then they smash whatever is there but then they pull out this is designed to destroy leadership not damage right so it's shock cavalry just like in real life the idea is to actually break the formation into disarray you can destroy the enemy's leadership of course if they're losing the engagement if they're being peppered by arrows and guess what another charge from the other end will absolutely be decisive the skill in using shock cavalry is to keep them in between engagements only sticking them in there for say five to ten seconds to maximize their charge damage before moving on to a new flank or harassing some archers the charge bonus goes down over time for 13 seconds so Keep them in there for a few seconds and then hightail them back out there. Either go for another charge, but what can be even more fun is if these gunners were being tied up, we can then hop over there, smash them, and then move around. So it can be a little bit more micro intensive. Similar to offensive infantry, you only need two units of them in your army. You should always be focused mostly around defensive infantry to hold your line. So you typically want at very minimum two, probably four, six units of defensive infantry. Then you only need maybe two, three, at most four offensive infantry. And unless you're a cavalry based faction like Bretonia, you at most need four cavalry units. I would honestly just start off with one, maybe two. Now, what about flying units? Well, flying units are also cavalry. The way you treat them is literally the same. And we'll get to monsters a bit later, but it's the exact same deal. We just move up, we move around. We want to be targeting enemy archers, charging into them, and hopefully they skirmish away so they can't shoot back at us. Stopping the enemy archers from shooting is one of the best things you can do with your cavalry. And don't forget, even on the harder levels of difficulty, the enemy gets a reload bonus, so they are doing more damage with their range units. This is still a relatively ranged meta. Stopping the enemy from shooting at you instantly puts things back in your favor. Flying cavalry are the exact same as regular cavalry, except they can go over and you have a bit more flexibility, but just don't forget that they're sitting up higher. They are going to be an easier target for archers and even gunpowder units will be able to hit them. Just make sure you keep on doing clicks in different directions, keep them moving, hold shift to draw an S-band, Whatever, just don't leave them standing out there. Now, what about casters? Casters are the same. We have a fire wizard right here, and he is on a flying pegasus. The idea is, is that he is a skirmish unit. Next up, we have skirmish units, and they can come in the form of horse archers. In this case, gunners on horses, skink spitting darts, as long as you can fire and shoot while moving. That is the key thing for a skirmish unit. They don't always have to, sometimes they do have to actually stop, take aim, but if you have the movement speed, you can still skirmish. The unit needs to be fast, it needs to have a ranged attack, even better if you can do it while moving. My default setting is always to have guard mode on. That means when the engagement's won, they won't just keep chasing after them and then lose cohesion. I always want that on, but I also take skirmish mode off because skirmish mode means your range units will then just run away. But on your missile cavalry, especially if your micro is not too crash hot, 
leave it on. This means as the enemy gets close, they will automatically cart away. Just keep in mind you might need to switch it off because they might derp if you're trying to control them, but that's a safe bet to have. You can often Vanguard deploy these, meaning they'll be up this end here, and you can kind of mess around with their formations and annoy them a bit. So that's the idea of skirmish units, is that they don't want to be getting caught at any time, but when they run out of ammunition, you want them cycle charging in to damage the enemy leadership. Even if you're not hurting them that much, just remember you can hold alt to override and use melee mode. This means your skirmish infantry can charge into other units using the skirmish mode to push them away. Unit type number five, archers. Now archers are exactly what you think they are, but the reason we separate them out as different is because they have a volley style attack. They will be able to fire over anyone in the front row, if it's a settlement battle, they'll be able to shoot over walls. Very, very flexible, but they also gain some advantage if they have a direct line of sight. You can get some good saturation by having them in a line formation, but if you want to quickly turn them, this will take longer to turn because the guys on the outside of the formation have longer to run. You'll get much more ease of use by having them in squares, not too close together, so if someone ties up one, they won't tie up two of them. You can get a lot of efficiency as well by hot keying them a couple at a time, over here and over here, and the idea is that if I see a unit come in there, I can focus fire with them, I can now hot key to them, and then focus fire with these guys. So that's the idea. In terms of stats, they're usually all pretty damn garbage at fighting, but the idea is you build a formation like this so they never ever get into combat. If they get one, you don't want them Ready getting the other. You keep units apart so they don't get all tied up at once. Unit type number six, gunpowder units. Gunpowder units sport far greater armor piercing than archers. When it comes to the mid to late game, you will definitely notice your archers, just all your arrows will bounce off some of the heavy armor that's out there. If we compare the stats, just hover your cursor over the missile strength, and as you can see, we have 24 damage. Only six of it is armor piercing. Compare that to the handgunner, 17 of its armor piercing. So archers will still be able to eventually whittle them down. They will eventually get through and they can still, of course, damage the enemy's leadership. But against those high armor threats, nothing beats these guys, but they do need a straight line of sight to be able to hit the enemy. This is why we have placed them at the front of our archers, the archers in volley over the top. These guys get straight line of sight, and we've also put our melee infantry, our defensive infantry, up the front here. As the enemy gets close, if they go for these guys, we can just try to tie them up here, and these guys will be able to just shred them in the sides, in the rear, and that's the whole point. Try to keep this area here open and you want a nice long line with gunpowder units. That line of sight can be maximized with a nice straight line. You don't really want to be repositioning them too much and once again their melee stats don't really matter. Your job is to set up a formation so they don't get exposed. Unit type number seven, something basically everyone has, is artillery. You could probably guess long range heavy damaging shots. You can leave them to fire freely or you can even target clusters of enemy units so you can try to manipulate their formations with your cavalry at the start of the battle. Anything that touches these guys will break them. That's why we have our formation set up to be able to protect our front line as well as our rear line. You will usually see the enemy cavalry try to come around here. They'll see spears at the front, think, bad idea. Let's find somewhere we can go. They'll see a gap here, hit the archers, or they'll even want to hook around and take these guys out here. What we do is we try to match them. They come around this way, we match them there, right? So you're just stretching out your line and reacting to where they go to block them. And now they're tangling 1v1 with a unit which gains a melee attack bonus versus them because they're large. Last up, we have monsters and I don't have any monsters fielded here, but they are just single entities, usually very, very big, and they're capable of dealing massive damage to infantry blobs. And usually the way to deal with them is just by mass Volley gunfire, or finding things with really great armor piercing, or things like halberdiers. Halberds are usually the weapon that is used on infantry to deal with really big monsters. So, kind of spears are for mainly for horses and for blocking infantry. The halberds tend to be for flying units and for more advanced cavalry types. Monsters can also be flying, like dragons, the exact same deal. Try to shoot them down before they get close when they do come in. 
focus file them down if they get tangled and stuck against a unit like this, which has great anti-large and armor piercing, they will regret doing so, and it's just a case of focusing them down. If you're the one using monsters, the idea is if they're flying, keep them moving and pick those engagements. If it's on foot like a treeman, move it up and make sure you use your mobile units to disable their range units and get rid of the biggest threat there. Once your monster has control of the center, you'll be able to operate around it and get those amazing shots in the rear as well as rear charges. Even your lords and heroes will fall under some of these categories. Here we have a foot lord. Now, I have an arch lector here, and why have I kept him on foot? One thing I really want to make clear here is that units that are on foot have their own value. They don't get hit by anti-large. If we put this guy on a horse, he gains mobility, but he's now more vulnerable to anti-large. He's also up higher, so he can be hit by gunfire. He's going to be a bigger target, so archers can shoot him down. There is a lot when you consider the mount. Now, the system has changed. It automatically upgrades you to the most uh, recent mount, and that's not always the best idea. Flying mounts can be great, but other times you might want someone down here as a defensive oh, infantryman. This can be incredibly powerful because if we can get this guy to hurt up a whole enemy unit, They've got all their numbers there. This gunpowder unit is going to absolutely eviscerate whatever is wrapped around there. So consider if they're a melee unit, I don't recommend horses. Unless you're going to put them with a unit like this and make a squad out of them that's a bit more advanced, but you can do that. But if you want to use them in the early game, keep them on foot. Don't do horses. Where, when do you want horses though? You want horses on skirmish units and fast hitters. So things like mages, great use of flying pegasus. So those are the eight components of any army. Defensive infantry, needing high melee defense and armor. Offensive infantry, specializing more in doing damage like armor piercing and melee attack. Shock cavalry, very similar to offensive infantry, except they always want to be charging. Chariots also fall under shock cavalry. And so do most flying units. Skirmish units, simply something that can move quickly and shoot. Remember to use skirmish mode if you don't have your eyes on them. Archer units, units that fire a volley over your front line, really great to support your units and can deal great damage as well as leadership. Every army should have some of these, regardless of who you play. Gunpowder units are only available to some factions, but they do incredible armor piercing damage, but require correct line of sight, as well as good formations to make the most of them. Artillery, things that sit around the back line, remember to keep some defensive infantry nearby to protect them, or have some very fast heroes. Can be very handy in certain circumstances by forcing the enemy to come to you if they're getting rained on, as well as are useful in settlement situations. And finally, monsters, just big large creatures that come lumbering to smash infantry, and some of the faster flying ones like the Arcane Phoenix can even hunt down lords and characters. And that's it, that's all eight units. You can categorize anything you want into those, and hopefully this gives you an idea on how to build your formations. But the biggest tip I could give you is having four corners and having a melee defense unit on each of those. Now, not every army will use each of these components. Let's say the High Elves, they don't have any gunpowder at all. They also don't have that great offensive infantry units, but they have incredible defensive infantry units, and they have incredible archers. The Vampire Counts on the other end have really terrible infantry, but they have good gunpowder and great artillery. The Greenskins have really good offensive infantry, but instead of having lots of archers, you'll probably trade most of these out for offensive infantry units and some monsters. So each faction and race is very different, but this should give you the idea of how to protect the units that are a bit more fragile. Just to clarify, this formation will best suit defensive armies. That said, offensive armies will still want units with good defensive stats to absorb that front hit, freeing up their units to charge into existing engagements. In the campaign, units that are traditionally bad at one role can be buffed to be more than sufficient in one or several of these roles. All right, now how this all works together, let's start off with our artillery. Because it's so slow, it will really anchor our army. We can hold alt to move it around or control as well to tilt it either way. But most importantly, when we drop it, holding spacebar will show the range of all of our units. And we can see that roughly where they'll deploy, they should be in range, so no drama there. Now, one of the most famous formations because it's so effective is the checkerboard formation. We're now going to place our first defensive infantryman up here on the front, and slightly behind him, we're going to put our two offensive greatswords. 
This means infantry that come in and clash with this unit here can then be countercharged by these greatsword units. Now they've got decent defense, but a lot of offensive infantry units won't like witch elves and they rely on not taking the charge so they can have nice healthy numbers to deliver a charge of their own. Now in terms of checkerboarding, again, one reason why it's great to have heroes on foot is they can also act as a checkerboard unit in this way. A unit that comes in and gets tied up by this guy will be able to be pinned and allow for another counter charge so we're going to put our lord at number number one and our hero over here as number three he's a melee captain make sure that they are melee units i.e defensive lots of melee defense good amounts of armor. Now it's time to place our range units and placing range units is one of the most critical things when it comes to your formations because the use of your range units is pretty much going to be decisive because this is a ranged meta. If you are better with using your range units it will significantly give you the edge. So let's start off with gunpowder. We want a long straight line remember and we want them a bit further back than the shielded spearmen in case they eat some volleys to the face. So we have one gunpowder unit there and now behind him we will place two arch units. We're also going to set hold alt to separate them a little bit so if someone breaks through and gets him this guy is still free to support. Now let's do the same thing on the other side. Now let's number these guys say number four for this side and number five. This way they can double focus anything down, breaking the leadership even quicker. It's typically best just to leave gunpowder units to do their own thing. They have a habit of not being able to see and they're just running at the enemy like idiots. The best thing to do is if you need them to support this flank here, just draw a new line or just hold alt and control and tilt them slightly and then get them to pivot. So remember we need a defensive infantry now on each of the corners. And that's our front line basically done with shields up the very front to block and screen any units. You won't always be able to get shields depending on your army. Now we've got cavalry. Cavalry will always go on one of the wings. We'll just place them here in the deployment area and we will hotkey them, say number six. We also have a skirmish cavalry unit here. Pistoliers, just small firearms and they have vanguard deployment. So we'll put them out here. They're gonna be there to check and maybe harass a bit, but we wanna keep them in here because we know we're fighting Britonia. They will have lots of cavalry. We need to be able to protect from that. So we also have halberdiers and a second halberdier unit down here. Now, finally, our most important skirmish unit, our mage. And we're going to put him at the front. He's going to drop some spells, be moving around, harassing their archers before he comes back. So let's start the battle. We're going to move our cavalry out to the sides. And another advantage of hot king is we can fly around wherever we want. Double tap one to find our lord. Double tap two to find our caster. But here we are. We can move our cavalry up. They've got cavalry of their own. So we're actually going to come back a bit because we have the ranged unit advantage. We're going to force the engagement. Now they seem to have a catapult up here. We can use that to our advantage. All right, we can use, uh, let's cast Burning Head here. Always target ranged units first, if you can, because they are very, very dangerous. So they've just moved slightly, but we've done some good damage, and we want to be the ones forcing this engagement. So you can click down here, let's select our artillery unit, and we'll target some ranged units, why not? Don't leave your units like this. See how they're attracting a lot of fire? So if you're not that comfortable with it, these nimble uh, mounts can avoid a lot of fire, but if you leave them alone, they don't have a lot of tankiness to them. So you can always hold spacebar, now we're out of their range, he's safe there. We're just holding the right click button here to move them around and we can engage skirmish mode anytime we want and that will make them keep distance. Now we want these guys down the back to either harass or even hold alt and charge into these field trebuchets. And their army is now moving up. So let's hold spacebar, make sure that they're not outranging anyone too badly. It's all looking good so far and now our gunpowder units are starting to lay some hurt onto theirs. Looking good so far. So these guys have uh, skirmish mode enabled. So if they're getting pushed into the corner, we're just gonna switch skirmish mode off just for a moment. Get them out of this uh, this mess they're in. And we're going to hold alt and then force click in there. We will stop them from firing. We're going to draw these guys out into ranks that will best defend. And we're gonna move our infantry up. Now we're gonna use our focus fire ability to target their archers. We're gonna move them up a little bit Hopefully they don't step over other units. If they do that, they will impede their abilities. So here we are. We're using our halberdiers as offensive infantry in this case here. Charging in. We have existing engagements here. Let's charge our greatswords, i.e. our offensive infantry into them. And we can even hold alt to bring our mage down. He's going to take a lot of damage, but we've held them in place long enough to bring our greatswords in there. And now we can get him out of there so he can do some more damage. 
Now the fight's fallen into disarray, we can use our highly mobile skirmish unit, well in this case our caster, and we're going to move him up here to not only harass their units, but we're also going to try to take out their artillery, which basically is the last unit that they have. That can threaten our numbers because we don't want to take too much damage between battles. Repositioned our handgunners there to just keep laying the herd on. They're all tangled up, but we'll keep this unit here to just keep watch over them. We've got our artillery tangled in there, let's just draw them out of there, because they're the ones that are in danger. You only need a couple of units fighting a guy at once sometimes, so while he's doing that, we can arrest up these guys, just check that they're tired. Once they've recovered, we'll just charge them in there and they can finish this fight off, because this looks basically one. Cavalry are tied up, and just a decisive charge with our Reichsguard should break them, and the battle is won. If there's a single unit that just won't die, you can hold control and press M to select all your missile units if something like this is done and then right click on the enemy and you'll just blow them apart with all of the units. This is particularly useful if you have a big dragon or something land in your ranks and you just need to focus fire it to get rid of it, that will do it for you. Also at the end of a battle, control A, switch off guard mode and now your units will chase them down. Particularly cavalry are very very good at hunting down those leftover enemy heroes. And that's it for this video, hope you've enjoyed it, see you next time.